So I was asked to share today with you an exercise that I did with my team behind leadership. And it actually came out of last year, a little bit out of last year's leadership symposium, when John had asked the question about who are the people that we admire. And, and for me, it's a gentleman by the name of Major Dick Winters. And uh, some of you in the room may know who he is, some may not. But you're going to get to know who he is in the next 45 minutes or so to an hour. So um, I was asked to share this exercise with you. And it's a pleasure for me to be here today. So just to give you a quick synopsis of who I am, as Peter mentioned, my name is Tom Degnan. I'm the Mid-Atlantic Zone Director at Heineken USA. Uh, I've worked in the industry for 20 years, so I actually started when I was six, uh, believe it or not, <laughs> but came out of the womb with a beer in my hand. Um, actually, I, I actually worked uh, through retail through a good portion of uh, my high school and college years and then transferred to wholesale, worked for some small craft brewers, and then eventually here at Heineken USA. So I've been in the industry for about 20 years. Uh, began my career with Heineken USA in Philadelphia in 2001, served in a number of different roles, area sales manager, distributor manager, and most recently uh, zone director since 2007. I lead a team of seven area sales managers and 10 retail sales managers covering new, two states, New Jersey and Pennsylvania. Our volume is about 8.3 million CEs. My hectoliter math is a little shaky, so maybe some... Uh, some, some, someone from uh, South America can help me out, but it's about 706,000 hectoliters uh, that I manage. It's the third largest Dutch territory, meaning the Heineken brands in the United States, and we generate about $55 million in EBITDA for the company. So just a little background on who I am. So before I get into the exercise, I just want to give you a little bit of a background of where I was kind of personally and within the company at Heineken USA. The Mid-Atlantic Zone was a newly formed zone coming out of a HUSA sales restructure. So I had been promoted and I received this position in 2007 as the Mid-Atlantic Zone Director and it was my first opportunity to manage a rather large team. I had managed somewhere in the neighborhood of two to three people, maybe four. So this was my first opportunity to manage 20, about 20 people from different aspects of the organization. Some had come from IT, some had come from uh, national accounts and really brought in a diverse group of people on my team. And my main objective, obviously, was to get in and know the business and understand the business and the nuts and bolts and the numbers. But really, my number one priority was to create culture. And I think we always underestimate the power of culture. And I wanted to develop a team of leaders, both internally and externally. Externally meaning with our retailers, our distributor partners. And I wanted my team members to understand that leadership, Ramon, I believe you had brought it up earlier, that leadership exists at every level of the organization. You don't need to lead people to understand and to have leadership. And I wanted my team to understand that. And I wanted, the, wanted them to gain a deeper understanding of the role leadership plays in their lives, both as people leading and people being led. So I had a bit of a hurdle. You know, I thought to myself, man, how does one teach leadership? You know, is it something that's better experienced? Should I just throw them out there and really get, let them try to understand how they're going to be leaders? Or is it something that can be studied or even taught in a three-day session here in New York? And I really struggled with that. And I thought, man, are there real life examples to better understand leadership? Can we take a look at maybe effective leadership versus ineffective leadership? And was there a study that we could maybe do? And could I talk to my team about this? So, I really struggled with this and I started to run the business and didn't feel great about the culture of my team and, and as we got going here I, just, I thought more about this leadership thing and so one night I was sitting on the couch and an idea came to me and I think probably most of our good ideas come to us when we're <laughs> sitting on the couch and away from the business and had the remote control in my hand and I was flipping around and flipping around and I came across something and I'm going to show you what I came across. Is all right. Each trooper will learn this operation by heart and know his and every other outfit's mission to the detail. Now we will drop behind this Atlantic wall five hours before the 4th Infantry lands at Utah. Easy Company will destroy that garrison. decide to join the paratroopers. I wanted to fight with the best, sir.
So how many people are familiar with either the book or the HBO miniseries Band of Brothers? Wow, a little bit more than I expected. So for those of you that don't know, and, and I was fortunate in that most of my team knows, this miniseries premiered probably in about 2002, 2003. And I had done this exercise in, in 2007. And Major Dick Winters is somebody that we'll learn about and someone that truly inspired me. And I thought to myself, that's it. I can talk about his leadership style. And then I can also talk about some other leaders that premiered in the miniseries. And basically, it's based on the best-selling book by Stephen Ambrose. It's a true story. And it follows the men of Easy Company of the 101st Airborne Division through their, through their trials and tribulations in World War II. It starts with them at basic boot camp training and follows them all the way through to their time in England prior to the invasion of Normandy when they parachuted. Mind you, they volunteered to parachute behind enemy lines. They volunteered because, as that soldier said, he wanted to fight with the best soldiers in the war. They volunteered to parachute behind enemy lines. And it follows their trials and tribulations through the war, through Europe, and eventually to Hitler's lair in Germany. And it's just an amazing story that's just laced with leadership. And it was something that really spoke to me and truly inspired me. So what does Band of Brothers have to do with selling beer? Absolutely nothing, to be honest with you. But it has everything to do with leadership. Leadership on the battlefield can have a dramatic outcome on a particular battle or even an entire war. And as we know in the business environment, leadership shapes the culture of the company. And it can ultimately lead to the success or the failure of an organization. Within the first two episodes of the miniseries, and it's a 10-part series, it's about an investment of eight to nine hours, but it's truly an amazing miniseries, and the book is even better. Within the first two portions of the miniseries lies an incredible contrast of leadership styles between that of Captain Sobel and that of Lieutenant, who eventually becomes major winners. This exercise really compares and contrasts two unique leadership styles and how their approach influences behavior. And I think that's the most important thing here. It's not to say one style is particularly right or correct, but might one, one may be more effective to influence behavior. And the purpose of this exercise is to purely observe leadership styles. The presence of effective leadership will always drive results whether it's in the military or the business world. And that's what I love most about this. You can really see how effective leadership works, maybe versus leadership that's not so effective. And the bottom line is, I was truly inspired by Major Winters. He was an incredible leader that provided clear direction, motivated his troops, and above all, inspired them to achieve amazing results. It's truly amazing what these people achieved. They basically were the leaders of the, the, the Allied campaign in Europe and ultimately led to the success of the campaign. And this group, this, these men of Easy Company, were truly amazing people. So before I get into the exercise, I'm going to share with you what I did with my team, and, and maybe you can get a good flavor of it. So just a couple of things, a little bit of a disclaimer. I don't claim to be an expert in the field of military leadership or World War II history. I always like to put out there that, that right away because uh, this is just purely my take on this. Um, I have an indescribable amount of respect for the people that serve their country, whether it be the United States or other countries. I would never demean them, and they are truly incredibly brave people. And I think when we look at leadership styles here, it's just some good conversation about leadership. It doesn't take away from who they are as people. And I do have a deep, deep passion in leadership and what it can do for a company. This mini-series and major winners deeply inspired me. I would encourage you guys to look for someone that inspires you, learn from it, and share it. And that's all I did here. I really looked at somebody, and this is, I had a great opportunity in that there happened to be a movie pretty much made about this person. So I had a great opportunity to share why they inspired me. So the way I started the, the exercise with my team was I just put up four very simple questions. And we had everybody in the room. There was about 20 of us. And we were huddled around the table. And we put the business aside for a day. And I said, we're going to come in and we're going to talk about leadership. And so we're going to talk about the type of leaders we want to be within Heineken USA. So to kick it off, we just very four very simple questions. What are the traits of an effective leader? And what results can come from the effective leadership? And then on the converse, what are some of the traits of an ineffective leader? And what are some of the results that can come from ineffective leadership? So this is what my team surfaced up. I think as leaders in this room, this is all pretty rudimentary, pretty simple. When you talk about an effective leader, trustworthy, honesty, open-minded, approachable, compassionate, execution, integrity, all really basic characteristics that you would expect of a leader. And what results can come from effective leadership? Obviously, achievement. Some really simple things here. Team builder, positive attitude, confidence. 
And this was just to get, we had some really good dialogue just in terms of how the team felt about effective leadership. And then we turned it back on the other side and we talked about ineffective leadership and what are the traits of an ineffective leader. And some really good stuff here. Arrogant, self-promoted, unqualified, selfish, bad listener, bad communicator. And what are the consequences of ineffective leadership? Failure, death, interesting one. Certainly in the military world it can lead to death. In the business environment it can lead to the death of a company, potentially. Mutiny, that's one that we'll actually take a first-hand look at today here. So, a brief look into the exercise and how we did it. The exercise, as I mentioned, really focuses on two people. The first is that of Captain Herbert Sobel, who's played by David Schwimmer, hard to imagine uh, our friend Ross from Friends play, <laughs> playing a captain uh, in the Army, but because uh, he's quite an annoying character in that show. But uh, he actually does a tremendous job here. And then we take a look at the person who inspires me the most, and Lieutenant. In these two clips, he's Lieutenant. He eventually goes on to be ma Major, and he's played by a gentleman the name of Damian Lewis, who you may recognize, who was also a really strong actor. So, as I mentioned, I strategically selected clips from the first two episodes that demonstrated the leadership style of these two men. So we spent probably three hours taking a look at clips. And you know, for me, it was a great opportunity for the team to bond. And this is an incredible story about the history of the world and the history of the American Army and, and, and World War II. And I think everybody in this room and that room has an amazing amount of respect for these people. And this miniseries was incredibly well done. And it gave us the chance. Part of it is very violent really violent and you have such an appreciation for what these men and women went through and it was just a great opportunity for us to bond but most of all to take a look at leadership styles. So I strategically selected clips. These were the list of clips that I had shown that went through and we're going to show some clips here so you can get a sense for it but this was just my guide as to what clips we were going to show and then as the clips ended we would have some dialogue and talk about the leadership style that was shown in that clip. So prior to it in case somebody in the room had not seen it I gave a one-sheeter that described the episode we were going to take a look at. And it's the first episode in the miniseries. I don't expect you to read that, but I just wanted you to have an understanding that, hey, if you hadn't seen the miniseries, this gives you a little background of who the characters are and who the people are. And then we had some leadership notes to think about as you're watching it. And I actually provided the team with a picture of the two leaders that we were studying, Captain Sobel and Major Winters, and they could make notes as we went along. So the first, the, what we're going to, the first part we're going to do here is take a look. Oops, sorry. We're going to take a look at first the first clip. And the first series really focuses on the leadership style of Captain Sobel. So we're going to take a look at a clip that really gives you a sense of who Captain Sobel is as a leader. You people are at the position of attention. Private Picante, have you been blousing your trousers over your boots like a paratrooper? No, sir. That explained the creases at the bottom. No excuse, sir. Volunteering for the parachute infantry is one thing, Picante, but you've got a long way to prove that you belong here. Your weekend pass is revoked. Name? Lord George. Dirt in the rear sight aperture. Pass revoked. When did you sew on the chevron, Sergeant Lipton? Yesterday, sir. Long enough to notice this. Revoked, sir. Name. Malarkey. Donald G. Malarkey. Malarkey slang for bullshit, isn't it? Yes, sir. Rust on the butt plate hinge spring, private bullshit. Revoked. Name. What do you got, Joseph D. Sir? Rusty bayonet, Lieb got. You want to kill Germans? Yes, sir. Not with this. I wouldn't take this rusty piece of shit to war, and I will not take you to war in your condition. Now, thanks to these men and their infractions, every man in the company who had a weekend pass has lost it. Change into your PT gear. We're running Curahee. So Curahee's a mountain that's about 
seven, eight miles to the top and then back down. So you kind of get a sense for what he's about there. This is about a year into boot camp. And I think military leadership like that is no surprise. It's just a little bit of a different approach. And I think you get a sense for what Sobel is there. Now keep in mind, I think he probably felt this is a leadership approach he needed. He was preparing these men for the rigors of war and what they were about to face. So you can see that the, his approach and what he felt he needed in that situation. Was it effective versus ineffective? We'll learn a little bit more. So I'm going to show you another clip. It's a short clip, but Sobel learns the news that Winters gets promoted. Now, Winters is his subordinate, and he reports into Sobel. And he gets to share the news of uh, someone that reports directly into him of his promotion. And we'll show you how, how Sobel feels about that and how he treats him. Colonel Singh has seen fit to promote you. As first lieutenant, he'll serve as my executive officer. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. And as a test of your organizational skills and command potential, I am designating you mess officer for 14 days. Report to the mess kitchen at 0515 hours. Company breakfast to be served at 0600. Yes, sir. So I'm not sure who's familiar with a mess officer, but it's really not a great duty. So here's one of his people getting promoted, and he basically sees Colonel Sink found it fit to promote you, doesn't say anything about how he felt about his promotion, and then he assigns him to the mess hall. Not a great duty. So interesting there, probably not a very motivational type leader, and the way he shares the news, of it, which is great news, the promotion of one of his men as they're getting ready to invade D uh, Normandy on D-Day, um, wasn't celebrated, wasn't mentioned in front of the troops, and was kind of done on the side uh, in an interesting fashion. So. We're learning more about Sobel here, and with my team, we really dug in. There's so many clips in here that and I had a tough time, I was saying to John, really choosing the clips I wanted to show to you guys. But this next one I really enjoy because it, it, it probably resonates for most of us in this room. So this is, they're in Georgia, and they're getting ready. They're about a week or two to fly over to England, where they're going to set up camp prior to the invasion of Normandy. And they're doing a field exercise. And Sobel's in the field, and he's leading his team, and he gets put in kind of a precarious situation. And he looks to his direct report, who was still Winters at the time, and kind of says, what should we do? And Winters offers his solution, and you'll see how Sobel handles it. And I think, you know what, I'll show the clip, and then I'll talk a little bit more about it. We're in the wrong position. We're in the wrong position. position for ambush, sir. Think we should sit tight and let the enemy team come into our killing zone. They're right out there somewhere. Let's just get them. Sir, we have perfect cover here. Look, can I deploy your troops? Captain, you've just been killed, along with 95% of your company. Your outfit? Easy Company, 2nd Battalion, 506. So you see the effect that has on the men. And Captain Sobel was known to be a very poor field tactician. You know, so in my, my opinion, a good leader is smart enough to know what they don't know and surround them with people that know it. And I think that... You know, you look at us and we go out into the field and we work with our people and as managers we like to think that we know it. We know everything. You know, sometimes we don't. Sometimes that's why we have people and we need to let them do their jobs. And I think what I love the most here, or dislike I should say, is that Sobel clearly was unsure about it. He had Winters who's a known field tactician. He asked him what we should do. Winters provides a solution and Sobel says, we're not doing that. And you can see the result. Death. Had they been in Europe it would have been death. So I think it's really interesting to study that and take a look at it and understand that sometimes your people may know more than you and sometimes you need to rely on them to make those decisions for you and you, you should use them. So I think that's really interesting. So the last clip we're going to show about Sobel and then we'll move into winners a little bit is an interesting one and I'll let it speak for itself. 
He's not actually even in this clip. So we're going through with this, right? We gotta do something. Yeah. 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 All right. Good. But we'd all better be clear of the consequences. I don't care about the consequences. John, we could be lined up against the wall and shot. I'm ready to face that. And every one of us had better be, too. I will not follow that man into combat. Me neither. Let's do it. Hereby, no longer wish to serve as a non-commissioned officer in easy company. So it's June 5th, 1944. It's the eve of the largest military action in the history of the world. And these guys are going to go to their superior and say, we're not going to war with Sobel. And I mentioned mutiny, and I think it's interesting. These guys risked being court-martialed and shot to basically go to their commander and say, we're not doing this. We're not going into Normandy with him as our leader. And I think there's a few things to take from this. One, if you think your team's not talking about you when you're not there, you're highly mistaken. And if you think your, your leadership is not an effective one and your team doesn't know it, you're highly mistaken. Your team's going to talk about you. There's no doubt about that. And I think it's important that you encourage dialogue both ways to talk about leadership and understand where your team's head is at. And you don't want it to come to this. This is a really bad place to be. So it's interesting. And there's so much more about Captain Sobel. And he was a good man, but probably wasn't a great field tactician and therefore didn't have the respect of his team, which ultimately led to his demise. And he stayed in the Army, and he went off to, tr to, to teach uh, training. And he actually didn't go into Normandy for the uh, original jump. So interesting with these men risk because they weren't comfortable going into battle with him as a leader. So now we start to talk about major winners and you know most of the series as it progresses forward really focuses on a few specific men in Easy Company, major winners being one of them. Um, and we move into the second episode here and we're getting closer and closer. That was June probably 3rd, 4th. They invaded, uh, the Allied troops invaded Normandy on June 6th. So this takes us into the invasion of Normandy. And again, this is just a synopsis of the second episode, but really we start to look into the leadership of Winners versus Sobel. So first clip, very simple one. Winners kind of sees one of his lieutenants gambling with the men, something that probably wasn't totally encouraged. The privates, the enlisted men gambled all the time, but very rarely would officers get in there and gamble with them. So Winners catches one of his men doing it, and you'll kind of see how he reprimands him. Through the toughest training the army has to offer under the worst possible circumstances and they volunteered for it christ dick i was just shooting crap through them it's not like you I know why they volunteered so when things got really bad the man in the foxhole next to them would be the best not some draft d who's going to get him killed are you ticked because they like me because i'm spending time to get to know my soldiers i mean come on you've been with these guys for what two years I've been here for six days. The gambling box. So what? Soldiers do that. I don't deserve a reprimand for it. What if you'd won? What? What if you'd won? Never put yourself in a position where you can take from these men. So interesting, it really wasn't about gambling, it was about putting himself in a position to take from the men. And I think that was what Winner's problem was there, but I really liked the way he handled it, didn't demean him, didn't have him running up mountains, just had some really good conversation, actually let him push back a little bit, and they had some good dialogue about it. So just an interesting leadership style there, one that I admire. As we move through the series here, they're getting ready to invade Normandy, and this next clip is an emotional one for me. These guys are getting ready to get on the plane, it's really well done, and... Uh, 
probably thinking that they're going to die. I mean, if you think about it, they're going across, across the Atlantic, going to parachute in behind enemy lines and in Normandy and really uncertain of what they're going to, what they're going to encounter. Um, so it's a really intense moment in the miniseries. It's actually a true story. And I think when you think about leadership, so imagine Winters in front of his men there as they're getting ready to get on the plane to fly to Europe to fight the war. What do you say? I mean, is it rah-rah time? Is it a speech time? Is it a time to get the troops fired up? How do you do it? And I think this is where situational leadership comes into play. And you really need to understand maybe where your people are at mentally in a given time. Now, I think most leaders here would maybe look for the give them hell speech. And I really like Winner's approach here. And this is, this is actually very factual. I read about this a few different times. And I'll show it to you. Second platoon, listen up. Good luck. God bless you. I'll see you in the assembly area. Stopped early. Second platoon, listen up. Good luck. God bless you. I'll see you in the assembly area. Oh. Give it one more shot. Ah, uh, looks like we're not going to get it. I'm not sure what happened, but boy, that kills my mojo. Um, but I think the, the great part of that scene is there is that, you know, Winters, he goes right down the line, and he looks every one of them right in the eye, and he helps them up. These men actually had gear on them that weighed more than they do. The Brits actually came up with a um, uh, kind of an accessory that they would attach to them the day before they jumped in that weighed about 100 pounds and they thought they were going to parachute off the plane and keep this gear on them. Most of the gear spread across Normandy and they never got it, but they couldn't even get themselves up. Um, most of the gear weighed as much or more than them. So you talk about leadership. He first of all, he just kind of says, God bless you and is so confident that he'll see him on the other side. Um, looks them in the eye and it's a pretty emotional scene. He goes through every one of them, helps them up, looks him in the eye and doesn't say a word. Almost says, to me, it almost says, I'm there. I actually get chills when I think about it. I'm going with you guys. I'm going to be there. We're going to be there together. Doesn't really need to say anything. Just goes right down the line, shows the leadership of helping them up. He actually pushes them into the airplane, and off to Normandy they go. So again, in a leadership style that appealed to me, and I really appreciated. So the last clip we're going to show, um, and I really struggled with this, the last one to show, because there's really a lot here uh, with winners going forward. And, the last clip we're going to show here is they've landed in Normandy. So when they were going over, they actually ran into some cloud cover that they didn't expect, and they got a little scattered. So they didn't hit the drop zone. Most paratroopers did not hit the drop zone going behind Normandy, drop zone being where they wanted to land to carry out their operations and procedures. So when they landed on the ground, they were scattered. They were a little nervous, a little scared. They weren't really sure where they were. Um, didn't come out quite as planned it eventually did. but. Uh, so you'll see here, Winters comes across a private, and you'll kind of see how he engages him, calms him down, and I think shows really extraordinary leadership in a situation that Winters was probably a little unsure, probably even a little scared himself. Oh. Shit. I don't think that's the correct reply, Trooper. I say flash, you say thunder. Yes, sir. Thunder, sir. Use that back. Coach? Sir, it's Halter. I was on the basketball team. Light back. Prop last, got it, sir. And my radio and batteries with it. Mine too. Landed somewhere behind those trees. Okay. Follow me. Until they reload. 
Abel, sir. Guess that means one of us is in the wrong drop zone, sir. Yeah, or both of us. Do you have a weapon, sir? Just my knife. Do you have any idea where we are, sir? Some. So you're a radio yes, man. Yes, sir. Well, I was until I lost my radio on the jump. I'm sure I'll get chewed out for that. Well, if you were in my platoon, I'd tell you you were a rifleman first, a radio man second. Well, maybe you could tell that to my platoon leader when we find him, if we find him. It's a deal. First, I need your help. Locate some landmarks to get our bearings. Keep your eyes peeled for buildings, farmhouses, bridges, roads, trees. I wonder if the rest of them are as lost as we are. We're not lost, Brian. We're in Normandy. So he takes the private in a kind of a position where he's uncertain and calms him down. And there's so much said there. First of all, he was honest. He kind of said, I'm not really sure where we are. He had a knife. The private had a gun. Didn't even think about taking the gun from him. Um, I just think there's some great extraordinary leadership there. Calmed him down, got him thinking straight. And as the miniseries progresses, you start to see Winters lead his group. And it gets pretty violent. I didn't think it was probably appropriate to share with this group. It's actually pretty bone chilling. In a smaller group, it works pretty well because I think the room's kind of so stunned by how the miniseries is done, all based on a true story. Um, and, you know, I think that. You start to see winners really evolve as a leader. Keep in mind, he's only a lieutenant here. He gets two or three more promotions to major. And you really start to see some great footage of him leading his team. Uh, it's not so much the one-on-one -on -one coaching that you see here. It's more team and kind of team building and leadership. So um, didn't have the time to share a lot of those clips with you. I personally could watch this stuff all day. I love it. Um, but it, that's, that's, in essence, the exercise that I had done with my team spent a good two or three hours looking at these leadership styles, having great conversations and debates about them. You know, and for me, it just comes down to a few simple things, and I'll share what my team surfaced up here. But for me, it kind of talks about, do you want to be a leader that leads out of fear, or do you want to be a leader that leads out of inspiration and inspires people? And if you're a leader of fear, it's probably going to catch up with you at some point. If you're a leader that truly inspires people, that's probably going to work in the long run. So that's kind of my take. And I look at Sobel really motivated his people out of fear. You know, if you don't do this, this is going to be the consequence, as opposed to inspiration in terms of if you do this, this is what's going to happen, and this is why it's going to happen, and it's going to work out really well for you. A little more inspirational. So team went through the exercise, went in breakout groups, had some dialogue, came back, and they surfaced up some basic theories, and I just tried to capture them here in writing. So strong leaders know when to pat their people in, on the back and when to kick them in the ass. It is vital to understand the makeup and character of those you lead and what method of leadership motivates them. Leaders are not always chosen. They are individuals that rise to the occasion when presented with a unique set of, set of circumstances in which leadership is needed. And that's actually kind of what happened to winners. As you go through the series, you'll learn that his commanding officer died, and he found himself in this position to be a major, which is a pretty heavy burden to bear, especially as you're going through Europe and World War II, and was a truly amazing leader and just found himself in that situation. Leaders can be ordinary people that are just willing to step up. Being a leader is a lifestyle and a way of being. And every person in the room has the ability to be a leader in their own unique way. Ramon, I know that's what you spoke about. Seek opportunities to say, follow me, and then lead the way. And actually, you heard winners there say, follow me. So that's what my team surfaced up. A few thoughts. It actually got a little bit deeper than that. But uh, this is kind of I just wanted to share with you. And the last thing I wanted to share with you, and I'm going to read these verbatim because I really like them. Um, one thing we struggle with, I know Sean's talked about it, is how do you keep these, these kind of sessions you go through alive? You know, we talked, I've had a number of training sessions here at Heineken USA. We do our best to keep them alive, but as the weeks and the months and the years fade, you kind of lose touch with what you learn. So I've just done something kind of simple to keep this alive with my team. Every time we get together, every zone meeting we have where the whole team's there, I share this with the team and we just read through them and we talk about it a little bit. And all it is, so Dick Winters went on to write a book, a um, very interesting book about his journey through the war. And he went and, and kind of also talked about leadership in the business world. And he has his 10 pr principles for success as a leader. So if you guys will indulge me, I'll actually just read them to you. I think you'll find them pretty, pretty interesting. So 
Number one is strive to, believe, to be a leader of character, competence, and courage. Number two, we talked about this. Lead from the front, say follow me, and then lead the way. Now number three, there's no way he wrote this for people that work in the beer industry. Stay in top physical shape. Physical stamina is the root of mental toughness. So um, obviously he wasn't out on the road peddling beer, but, uh, but nonetheless, probably not a bad idea if you can. So, but a few of these I really like. Develop your team. If you know your people are fair in setting realistic goals and expectations and lead by example, you will develop teamwork. Number five, delegate responsibility to your subordinates and let them do their job. You can't do a good job if you don't have the chance to use your imagination, creativity, and vision. And I think you spoke about that earlier, about vision. And you really need to let your people flourish. And if you put good people in the right position, they'll do well. And that will give you time to create your vision for your team. Number six, one of my favorites. Tough one always here in the beer business. Antici anticipate problems and prepare to overcome obstacles. He puts it in military terms. Don't wait until you get to the top of the ridge and then make up your mind. And that's really just as a good leader can foresee where the problems are going to come in. Seven, John talked about this a little bit, and I think this ties into the titles. Remain humble. Don't worry about who receives the credit. Never let power or authority go to your head. Number eight, take a moment of self-reflection. Look at yourself in the mirror every night and ask yourself if you did your best. Number nine, true satisfaction comes from getting the job done. And I think we would all probably agree with that. The key to a successful leader is to earn respect, not because of rank or position, but because you are a leader of character. And then 10, pretty simple, hang tough and never give up. So that, in essence, is a short version of the exercise. I'm not here to say this is right or this is wrong, but I'm here to tell you that Major Winners is someone that inspires me, and I really love his leadership style. And I felt I wanted to share this with my team. So as mentioned, I would encourage you guys to find people that inspire you, whose leadership that you really appreciate and enjoy, and find ways to share them with the people around you, whether it be your coworkers or the people that work for you. Um, so that's it. Sean had asked me, this one I'm a little uncomfortable with, but he asked me to talk about some of the successes of my team over the last few years. Um, in 2007, we were Zone of the Year for the Northeast Region. Last year, we were Newcastle Zone of the Year for the country. 100% um, of my team hit their shipment and even plan in 2009. Currently, we lead the country of the United States in Dutch and our Newcastle performance. Uh, four members of my team were selected to be on Mission Apollo, which John had talked about. And we've successfully built a winning culture where the team members are sharing best practices. There's a lot of interaction, a lot of talk. Um, people in North Jersey are talking to people on the western side of Pennsylvania about some of the things they're doing to look at the business differently. So can I look at this exercise and say, hey, this is why we're successful? I think I have a really strong team, and that's why. But that day, we certainly bonded a little bit. I actually gave uh, everyone on the team a sweater that said Heineken Mid-Atlantic Zone and Band of Brothers on the back. And it just created a bonding experience. And it gave us a real opportunity to take a look at a real life situation and real life leaders in the world. Um, and I really think it helped my team to understand leadership a little bit better. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to share it with you.